my biggest asset as a martial arts teacher was how hard I had to work at it to get good. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 618. My guest today is Shehan Kendall Buell. I'm Jeremy Lesnick. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you're interested in what we're doing to that end, check out whistlekick.com. It's our online home, and it's the place to find our store. And the code PODCAST15 is going to get you 15% off anything you find in there. Now, this show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new episodes each and every week, all with the purpose of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to support the work that we do, if that means something to you, well, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, check out our social media. You could tell a friend, leave a review, grab a book from Amazon, head on over to whistlekickprograms.com and check out what we got there or you could support our Patreon. If you think the new shows that we bring you are worth 63 cents a piece, well then, you might consider supporting us at five bucks a month. On top of that, we're going to give you extra stuff that we don't release anywhere else. Go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick to sign up. And if you do, well, there's a very, very good chance you're going to be overwhelmed with the amount of good stuff we throw your way. Over the last few months, I've had the opportunity to get to know Shihan Buell a little bit. But in this conversation today, we get to go deeper. I get to hear stuff from him I've never heard before. He is an amazing storyteller. I absolutely was, was transfixed at his stories. I have a feeling you will be as well. We probably could have done another hour, maybe two, to really unpack all of his story. But we didn't. We gave you this powerful, meaty conversation that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. So let's dig in. Kendall, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks, Jeremy. Real treat to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. We, we've had the opportunity to talk about a few things, but it, it's a pretty narrow set. And so now I get to do kind of double duty and get to know you better as, you know, as a martial artist, as a person. And I'm kind of pumped for that. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, good. Well. You know, here we are. I'm assuming you're not that far away from me. So I'm assuming the weather's just as gorgeous, maybe even a little nicer where you are. It's switched to Massachusetts and it's absolutely beautiful right now. Yeah. It's these are the days. And and for, for listeners, here here I am in central Vermont. It's 75 degrees. It's sunny with just enough cloud cover to break it up. And it's it's just one of those days that is it's perfect. These are my perfect days. And there are a few things that I would be excited to step inside for on a day like this. And <laughs> it, it's, it's, I'm not blowing smoke. I'm not lying. I love what I do. Doing the show is one of those things. I'm like, I get to go do this. And you know, one of the great things about days like these, the first really beautiful, warm days of the season is it puts everybody in a great mood. Yeah. And on top of that happening when it's happening, uh, because right now in Massachusetts, this is where we have finally been told when the, the last of the, the most stringent COVID restrictions are going to be lifted and uh, when we're going to be back to normal as, uh, as a business and, and a school. And that has everyone around here <laughs> in a really, really good mood, too. So, uh, yeah. Have but, the parade started? Yeah, abs- absolutely. <laughs> it, it seems it feels like uh, everything's a, a parade right now. So, yeah, yeah. A, a great day and uh, but yeah, a nice way to spend the afternoon, Jeremy. So thanks for having me. Hey, of course. Absolutely. You know, I've gotten to know you and, and your business a, a little bit over the last few months and, and that's been a lot of fun, but I, I don't, I don't know you. And, you know, sometimes we start this way. We don't always, but this is how we're going to get, get going. You know, let's, let's rewind. Let's rewind to the beginning of the tape or your comic book origin story or episode one of your TV show, whatever we want to think of it as. And, you know, what was your first experience with martial arts? My first experience with martial arts came uh, at the the first opportunity I got and about a decade um, after I wanted it uh, to happen. I Mm -hmm. was always asking my parents when I was growing up uh, to take karate lessons. It was just 
something I knew I wanted to do, something I knew would be right for me, and something that they were absolutely unwilling to entertain. I'm 50 years old, so if that, if that kind of you know uh, dates uh, what the, the the time that we're talking about, we're talking about uh, the late 70s and uh, through the 80s, and obviously people's perception of the martial arts, what it's all about and what it can do for people um, has really evolved in that time. You have to remember um, that back then uh, there was still the perception that it was purely about fighting, um, purely about the violence. And I was a kid, quite frankly, with poor impulse control. So I guess my parents just thought it was uh, socially irresponsible to uh, introduce a kid with uh, you know, poor impulse control, uh, a, a kid with, uh, uh, well, you know, now we know it to be uh, ADHD, but back then, uh, you know, uh, my teachers just considered me a spaz. Uh, I guess they thought- it's ironic, <laughs> though, <laughs> right? you know, with, with what both you and I know uh, teaching. Exactly. But, and I, and I think that's maybe why the martial arts were calling me. I, I think I understood back then uh, that I was going to find um, a, a stillness and a focus that um, I, just eluded me as a, a young person. But uh, my, uh, my parents, again, no matter how many times I a asked them, uh, did not think it was a good idea for me to be learning any fighting skills. Uh, so when I was 18 years old and I went away to college, first chance I get, I enrolled in a class. It was a, a Taekwondo class that was being offered as a, a, a phys ed credit at the college I went to in, in Michigan, Kalamazoo College. I, I grew up in Detroit. And uh, from there, I never looked back. Uh, a few years uh, later, I was uh, a foreign student studying in Beijing. I studied Tai Chi and uh, Changchun Wushu. I ended up uh, spending the next several years in the greater uh, Asian area. I, uh, when I was in, in Hong Kong and uh, I lived in Taiwan as well as a reporter, um, I dabbled in martial arts. Uh, it wasn't until, though, that I got back to... Uh, the United States. And in 1999, my wife and I um, had had daughters, so we were definitely starting to settle down. Uh, we uh, started to, to set roots, and I decided to get uh, very serious about my practice. And it was uh, at that time that I found Shaolin Kempo Karate, uh, which is what we teach at uh, the school I now own. So the, maybe the obvious question, but I feel like I have to ask it, were the travels to Asia related to the initial interest in martial arts? I wish I could answer that question, Jeremy, because it's it's something that um, I have always wondered. I felt a pull to that region of the world um, for, uh, uh, throughout my childhood and, and through my teen years. And it, it seemed to be kismet because um, I went to college and my freshman fall was the uh, first semester that the college I was at started uh, offering Mandarin Chinese courses. Uh, everybody at Kalamazoo College, and it's why I went there, did a foreign study, and they uh, told us that my class would be the first class with the opportunity to go study in Beijing. And here I am, a, a person who always felt that there was something in that part of the world that that was there for me that that I could um, that I was meant to learn and certainly the martial arts were a part of that part of my my awareness of uh, of Chinese and uh, Japanese culture and and part of the draw uh, but I, I wouldn't say, I wanted to go to that region uh, uh, purely to study. No. I'm doing some math. And if I'm doing my math correctly, your showing up in China was the, the timing of that was, was, <laughs> is, is really interesting to me because there was some really big stuff going on then. Yeah. Uh, your, your math is good. Yeah. So um, it was uh, my junior fall that uh, we were scheduled to um, go there. And it was um, in my sophomore spring. Uh, 
that the student protests um, cropped up um, in, in Beijing and specifically in uh, Tiananmen Square. I remember um, we actually had a, a symposium at the college. There were a, a number of um, well-renowned Chinese scholars um, at my school and in uh, some other schools who had uh, come in, and uh, they talked about um, the historical background of what was happening there, as well as the current events, what, what was going on there. And um, all of these experts on China, Chinese culture, the Chinese government, um, they all kind of took a stab at trying to predict what was going to happen with these uh, student protests. Nobody saw what was coming. And as a matter of fact, a couple of people said, uh, there is no way with the world watching that the communist government is going to uh, forcefully put down uh, these protests. And that, and, and it was it was only uh, within, a, I think, a week and a half, two weeks later, of course, uh, June 4th, that, um, uh, that the tanks rolled into the square and um, hundreds, perhaps thousands of, of people were killed. We, we, we still don't know. Um, and that was a major eye opener and a major uh, learning point for me, too, as I was preparing to, to go uh, live uh, in, in Beijing, albeit for only six months, that uh, here you had all these experts on that country and its government and its culture, and still none of them could predict exactly uh, what was going to be happening. And it certainly it was uh, a time of upheaval, and it, it, it put our own plans in a certain amount of upheaval, but um, we, uh, we decided that we were going to go uh, ahead um, with the uh, with the exchange, it was uh, me and four other students uh, from my school. And uh, frankly, by uh, the fall of 1990, when I did go to uh, Beijing, things had calmed down uh, quite a bit. And I was able to, um, after after several months of making some friendships and, and, and nurturing a couple of, of close relationships with uh, people that I met over there. I was able to, um, to talk and, and, and get, some, uh, get some, have some candid conversations about what that um, whole experience uh, had been like for the, the people who lived through it. So it, mm -hmm. it was very much a very interesting time uh, to be there in the aftermath of what had happened in Tiananmen Square. And at the beginning of um, a, a real opening up and westernization of uh, the People's Republic of China. Yeah. Now, I'm curious, your parents didn't want you to practice martial arts as a child, but how did they feel about you going to Beijing? Hmm. You know, it's funny. I, I've been thinking about that um, a lot lately. Um, as my my own uh, kids are uh, 22 and 24, my daughter ended up going to Kalamazoo College again for foreign study. She went off and studied in Senegal. Uh, my son decided to uh, that he wanted to study abroad. He is actually enrolled in University of Edinburgh. He's out in, over in Scotland right now. Um, and I could not be happier um, that they're doing it. But at the same time, it's very, very hard for me to, to see them go away. I worry, um, you know, uh, you know, particularly my daughter living, uh, you know, you know, so far away and uh, in, in a third world country that had me concerned. And it really gave me an appreciation um, for what it was like, uh, you know, for my parents um, to see me go to um to a very strange place in a very uncertain time and to give me their unconditional support in it. Um, but now I know, uh, you know, as, as a parent myself, that uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a tough thing for them. But I will say this, mm -hmm. uh, both of them, my, my, my parents, and, and they're not married, uh, both my parents and, and, and step-parents uh, made the trip over and uh, and stayed for a couple of weeks and we got to travel around together and I got to to show them around. So for them, it was a great opportunity to see that part of the world, too. Hmm. And I'm sure I, I, I think you mentioned that while you were there, you did find some opportunity to train. And was that am I, did I hear that correctly? First off? Yes. Yes. You OK. OK. Was that opportunity easily available or was that something that they were 
culturally resistant to Westerners learning? So it was, it was very interesting. Um, so my first experience there and, and, and was the first week there, I was uh, determined that as, as soon as possible, I was going to start uh, doing some sort of training. Um, and I talked to uh, the, the uh, teacher who had been the, the point uh, person of contact uh, for our particular uh, foreign study program there at the Beijing Language Institute. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, so meet me in this square, uh, you know, tomorrow morning um, at 630 in the morning. There's a there's a Tai Chi class. And um, so I, I, I showed up there very, very eager. And I I imagined that he was going to introduce me to uh, the, the teacher and that I was going to get an introduction to Tai Chi. Um, and what happened was I, I met him there and he showed me a spot in the back of this class, the class being, I would say, probably about 60, 70 people. Never met the teacher. The teacher was was way up front. Um, and I I just followed along. Hmm. Um, I was I was both thrilled and 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 frustrated, um, uh, frankly. Um just following along without uh without kind of being given a context for what we were doing without being given a foundation of of the basics obviously as we know is is just not a, a great way to learn um but it really also seemed to be what you know a lot of other people who were in the back of this massive group uh were also doing so i, I still felt like i was uh, was a part of of something um and i enjoyed it immensely but when i heard uh, that some of uh, some of the other uh, foreign students there were um, taking a uh, a style of wushu called uh, Changchuan um, long fist wushu. I was very interested in that, and um, there was uh, a young teacher there who um, actually happened to be from Puerto Rico. And he had been living in Beijing um, and studying at the sports college uh, for uh, a number of years. Uh, he had found um, a Kung Fu teacher there who had uh, really kind of uh, taken him in. And uh, he was just you know, uh, making ends meet by also doing some classes on the side. And he had gotten permission to teach Chang Chuan to um, some of the foreign students at the uh, Foreign Language Institute, and um, I got in with him, and it was just, it was a very informal arrangement. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd say, uh, pay me what you can, you know, which I did, and uh, I, I, I showed up for every single class, and I was, uh, I was practicing uh, all the time, but what we were doing is we were doing um, uh, forms, essentially. We were working basics, and we were practicing forms, and um, a couple of the guys that I was uh, taking uh, the, the, the class with, uh, some, some buddies of mine, um, uh, both uh, Russians, uh, actually Soviet Union still at that time, um, they started to get restless. And, and finally, they asked this teacher, they said, when are we going to learn fighting? When are we going to start sparring? And the, the, the Russians I knew loved fighting. I mean, you know, get a couple shots of vodka, and next thing you know, Gander, we must wrestle. And you know, everyone's just you know, <laughs> bouncing along the, the door rooms. But uh, the, the, the teacher explained to him that that was part of the deal with the authorities there, with the administration, uh, when he got permission to teach, was that he would not be teaching us actual fighting skills. There would be no application to to the kicks and and the part punches that we were learning. It, it would be really for for fitness only and, and really the uh, the art uh, side of it. So um, I, you know, I I never got to um, learn the fighting side. And my impression from what this teacher was telling us was that this was just the case. Um, in in any school around there that yes it was okay to uh to share this art to teach um these these various martial arts to foreigners um but not the fighting part of it hmm. okay 
Now you were there for six months. You mentioned Taiwan and working in Taiwan. I, I've got to guess that you came back. You were in the states, graduated, did some stuff here, and then went back there. Am I graduated? I and uh, you you got it. Graduated, bought a one way ticket to Hong Kong, um, which Commitment. at the time still a it was still a British colony. Yeah, it was you know kind of like you know burning the ship uh, when mm-hmm. you get there. Um, didn't didn't have a solid plan. Um, I just figured that, um, I was a, I was a communications major and everyone was telling me I should go into business if, uh, I, I wanted to be around uh, China because it was really starting to open up at that time. There were a lot of opportunities that didn't interest me. Um, I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to continue in communications um, to, to some part. Um, I had done a lot of radio um, at my college uh, radio station. Um, there were a bunch of English language radio stations in Hong Kong as it was still a British colony at the time. So I thought maybe uh, that was you know, a, you know, a good avenue to go. And, uh, and a, again, you know, talk about kismet. Um, a, a, a lot of doors, Jeremy, just seemed to open for me whenever I started heading in that direction. And sure enough, the the first three days I was there, um, I met uh, the the morning drive editor for the um, all news, uh, English language, all news station in Hong Kong. And uh, he set Mm. me up with an interview and within a week and a half of landing in Hong Kong, um, I had my first job in radio news. And that was something that uh, I, I still uh, I, I still do part time at WBZ in Boston. Um, that's something that I've been doing for uh, twenty nine years now. It's wow. awesome. Yeah, I feel very lucky. Yeah, yeah. It, it kismet really does seem to be the right word. And you know, I, I'm sure some will listen to this and think, "Oh, it, it's it's coincidence." But I've got to say that you know, feeling that draw to that area, that draw to martial arts and following that path where you felt drawn, it it seems to make sense to me. When I think about the good things that have happened in my life, I felt drawn in some way to something that led me to them. Mm. It wasn't accident. It wasn't someone forcing me to do it. It was, there was some element of me trusting my gut, the universe, however you want to phrase it. And ended up being good. I'm curious when you when you start thinking of of your life and your plans, how how mm. far ahead do you plan? I mean, do you have a <laughs> do you have a 5-year plan? Or... I've I've got a day plan, a week, month, year, quarter, and then as I once I get beyond quarter and year, it it gets a little bit more vague, but I do have some 2, 3 and 5-year plans. Yeah, they're 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 really 800 foot view. How about you? Um well, you know, just the way things have, have turned out for me, um, sure, I, I, I look into the future a, a little bit and say, boy, I'd like to be here. I'd like I'd like to school. Um, mostly when I think about the future, it's it's thinking about our school. Um, and I, I do say, OK, this is where I would like to be. This is the direction anyway that I want to head. Um, but just the way that my life kind of opened up in front of me, kind of unrolled in front of me. Um, I, I've realized that uh, making plans is, is you know, there's, there's, there's limited use to it because mm. the, the world kind of, the universe kind of seems to have uh, plans for you. I don't know if I'm getting too cosmic there or not, mm. but I... You, you can get as cosmic <laughs> as you want. Long time listeners know that you are not even close to the end of that spectrum of conversation. Right. We've gotten very cosmic on this show. We've had <laughs> we've had some interesting discussion for sure. Um things have always just kind of um in my experience the way I've seen it and and I'm not, I'm not talking about uh the the universe has a special plan uh for me, but um things have always just as long as I've been keeping my my eyes open um some interesting opportunities that presented themselves. I had no idea that I would ever own a martial arts school. I did have a, I have a real sense 
that martial arts were going to be part of my life, that it would be a lifelong thing. When, when I began training, something clicked for me, um, a, something that had felt missing, um, it, it, it was kind of like the, a, a, a piece of the puzzle just fit in there perfectly. But even at that time, I just thought it would be a, a passionate hobby. I, perhaps I could uh, imagine myself, you know, being a teacher after I'd, I'd had enough experience. And I was uh, overjoyed um, when my uh, sensei, at the first uh, Shaolin Kempo school that I went to, um, asked me if uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to help teach. Uh, but certainly I never thought that I was, I was going to open a school. Uh, and here it is 16 years later. Yeah. And, and so how do we, how do we get from you being surprised that he invites you to help teach to you opening a school? Were you, were you genuine? Let me ask that differently. We've had plenty of people on the show who have said, you know, from class number one, three, five, somewhere early on, I knew this was going to be my life. And in some way it was going to be my career. Did you have those inklings? No, not at all. It, it really happened in a flash. Um, I will say this. I realized early on that I was good at teaching. And here's the thing to understand. Um, Someone listening to me say that all my life I'd wanted to do martial arts, that when I found martial arts, um, that it, it seemed to be a part of me, that it spoke to me. Um, they might get the impression that I'm uh, a naturally gifted martial artist and uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. <laughs> um, I, I grew up, uh, in, you know, the, the last person picked uh, in pickup teams for, for any sport that, that you can imagine. Uh, the kid who rode the, the, the bench and, you know, on, a, on the flag football team, the soccer team, uh, all that. Uh, just a, a, a klutzy um, kid, no uh, athletic abilities whatsoever. My proficiency and, and, and then if, if I even dare use the, the, the term mastery of martial arts uh, came purely out of, out of stubbornness. I loved it. I wanted to be good at it. And so I just rolled up my sleeve. I tucked in and I, I, I got to work on it and I, I practiced relentlessly. Um, and, and, you know, it started to see the, the changes in myself. Um, so when I say that I, I found that I was a good teacher, um, that was a little bit of a, a surprise at first, but looking back now to me, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I've always said that my greatest asset as a martial arts teacher is how klutzy I was, how hard my, my biggest asset as a martial arts teacher was how hard I had to work at it to get good. Um, I'm, you and I both know, I'm, I'm sure, people who are just naturally gifted. It's yeah. like they, they came out of the womb you know, with doing flying sidekicks. And um, some of them are very good teachers. But I have also observed a lot of people who, for whom everything seemed to really come easily, who just are, are not particularly good teachers because I don't think they can understand what it's like for someone for whom it does not come easy, who does not have that natural athletic ability. Whereas having to have had to work so hard myself um, to, to understand the moves, to uh, commit them to muscle memory, um, I think that I'm, I'm able to help other people who um, are struggle. I think I'm able to help just about everybody um, along the spectrum. And I've, I've even learned to, you know, uh, give useful instruction to people who are uh, naturally uh, gifted. So when I realized that I was, I was good at it, um, and my teacher realized I was good at it, um, I started teaching more and spending even more time at the dojo. And uh, at one point, my, my teacher, uh, Mark Warner, 
he uh, he started telling me that I really should open my own dojo. And the the, the thought of of that, um, I, I I didn't even entertain it. The idea of opening my own business just absolutely uh, you know, terrified me. So much uncertainty. Uh, what were you doing professionally at that point? Uh, I had a morning drive radio talk show. Okay. And um, I, I did uh, for uh, many years um, until uh, new ownership. And, uh, and I got fired mm. and around that time, um, I, I, I picked up a, a, another job really quickly doing a, a part-time traffic reports for a lot of the radio stations in Boston, uh, had a conversation with the general manager at WBZ radio in Boston. And he, he said he was uh, very interested in hiring me, but that conversation went on for a year during which I, I was doing, uh, traffic reports. Um, wasn't particularly um, uh, gratified by the, the the work in radio that I was doing at the time. It was it was enough to to pay the bills, but I, I wasn't having a whole lot of fun. I was frustrated uh, with my conversations um, with the the boss over at WBZ, um, who said that he wanted to uh, to bring me on board, but kept on saying that the time wasn't right. And I was getting frustrated waiting for somebody else to tell me when the time was going to be right. So I was spinning my wheels a little bit. And it happened that at that time, the uh, Tokyo Joe's system of schools, uh, of uh, which Mark Warner uh, was a, a part at the time, uh, it was... Uh, at, at this point, seven schools um, across uh, southern New Hampshire and, and northern Massachusetts, they would have uh, black belt tests twice a year. And uh, all the schools would get together and, and, and test their candidates. And it was in April of uh, 2005 uh, that it was the very first black belt test at which somebody who I had taught or I had known anyway um, as a white belt had gone up to receive their black belt. It's, it's about, it's about a three year process, three, three and a half years um, in, in our system of schools. Um, if, if you are, um, if you are going continually through about three and a half years from the time you start until the time uh, that you, you get showed up. And I just remember feeling so proud that I had played a small part in this person's accomplishment. Uh, a guy by the name of Sam Coffin. He's a, a really good uh, friend of mine. And also to have seen... Um, his transformation and see everything that his uh, Kempo practice had brought him to know very well um, how much it had in, enriched my life in, in every single way. Someone who had always felt insecure about their athletic ability, now I, I felt confident about it. Someone uh, who, like I said, had uh, poor impulse control and serious, serious focus issues. I had found some modicum of, of, of peace and stillness and, and focus in my life. Um, it all just came to me at once the transformative power of martial arts practice, the force of good it is in the world, and that I was starting to, to be an agent of that force in other people's lives. And it was a revelation, man. I just got so excited about it. And I went home from that and I, I, I came to my wife, Caroline, that that very evening and i said to her honey i i want to open a dojo and i i think a, a lot of spouses out there i mean keep in mind i hadn't even entertained the idea before it's certainly nothing that she and i had ever discussed right out of the blue i i come home from a black belt uh, test and in, in ceremony and say darling let us 
sink our savings <laughs> into uh, into opening a martial arts school. How many spouses, uh, you know, uh, w- w- wouldn't at, at least look at their 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 husband or wife a little cross-eyed there? Uh, she was she me, training yet? She looked at me. Uh, yeah, she she'd started kickboxing, and and she said, "Yeah, let's do it." And I would, you know, afterwards tell her just how amazed I was by her that uh, that that was her response and, and how grateful I, I was for. Her. And and she would say that a she had seen the change in me that my training uh, brought me, um, the the peace and the happiness uh, that it gave me. Uh, I mean, she had known me when I was a much uh, wilder, uh, crazier, uh, perhaps angrier, uh, young man before I got really serious, um, into my training. And she saw just, she saw the level of conviction I had when I, when I came, uh, and, and proposed this to her, um, that she said she knew right then that it was the right thing. So even though she wasn't as as all in on training as you were, she was able to recognize, she was able to see how impactful it had been on you. And I would imagine being that you were married, she knew this need for you to follow your path, to to, to honor where you were being called and yeah. go God, with it. God bless her, man. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a major leap of faith uh, on on her part, and uh, you know we've we we both say it's one of the greatest decisions that we've ever made. You know, second only to the the, the kids that we had, and we 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 refer to the dojo as our third kid. So, <laughs> I'm sure you're not alone in that. Right, right. Okay, and and so that was 2005. That was 2005. So, so yeah, April was that uh, was that uh, fateful black belt test, mm-hmm. and uh, by uh, we our first class was on September 13th, 2005. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that wasn't long. No, no, it wasn't. After all this time of you know my uh, teacher suggesting it, me not even entertaining it. Um, once I made up my mind, once that lightning bolt struck there at that black belt test in April, um, just, we were all in. Did the feelings of terror at the idea of teaching, you know, from that day when your instructor said, Hey, I want you to help teach. If we think about that time versus day one, September 13th, were you more or less terrified when you started your own school? Uh, more terrified, but it was a different kind of, of terror. Sure. Um, you, by, th- by that time, I started feeling comfortable and in front of a class, uh, v- very much so. Um, but it's you know, a very different thing um, when suddenly you're the person who's who's paying the bills and you got the rent to pay and I, again you've you've sunk your um savings into it and and your family's livelihood um is at stake that is that is a very different thing and you know i just remember all the work that we put into setting up the dojo and then the schedule and all the promotional stuff that we did and uh you know I, I, again this had really been you know my life um it's it's the idea of okay what if you throw a great big party and and nobody shows up and and that was it it was just an article of faith okay if if we do this um people will come and and they'll like what they see and they'll stick around and um you, you know i i always you know through throughout life just really battled lots of uh lots of doubts as to you know whether i was uh, ready for what i was taking on whether i was uh, taking on you know more than i can handle i mean don't um 
don't let the amount of passion I have for this and, and the amount of commitment that I described to you as far as doing this thing, um, let you think that I, I, I wasn't riddled with, with, with doubts about it because, uh, because I was. And, um, a, a lot of sleepless nights uh, staring at the ceiling. Um, mm. But, you know, that, that in itself was something that my, my practice, my, my training got me through. That really is the story of martial arts, isn't it? Is we we are given more than we think we can handle, but within the context from someone who's been through the process and recognizes mm. that it's not. Mm. And it's only on the other side that we can look at it and say, oh, clearly it wasn't. I made it through. Hmm. Yeah, well put. So talk to me about what you've got going on now. I mean, you, we, we just were coming out of probably the most difficult time for martial arts instructors. I mean, not, not to, to act like it hasn't been difficult for everyone in all walks of life, but it's a martial arts show. So we're going to talk about martial arts. The last year plus has been the most difficult period, I would say, for martial arts school owners, instructors that has existed in modern times. Mm. And your school is still here. And first off, how did you do that? How, why are you still here? It was a real quick turnaround in my attitude back in the days when we first started hearing about this virus. Um, having, you know, having lived in Asia and, and um, you know, having seen SARS in Hong Kong and, uh, you know, in, in Canada and H1N1, of, of course, I thought that this was going to be something that was a little scary at first, but that was was going to die down. And I, I wasn't feeling too concerned about it. But that, uh, that, that, that changed very quickly and, and started to realize um, that, yeah, this was, was going to get serious. And I think we, we, we all have that experience to to one degree or another when it yeah. looked when it looked like things were going to get serious i took my team out to dinner my wife and i did went out and grabbed some mexican a couple margaritas um it was our instructors, uh, our office manager, my wife, and um, a uh, a student of ours who is absolutely a, a computer genius, um, who was very, very passionate, not only about her training, but about our community and had offered her services uh, before, um, computer-related, um, website-related before, and I, I wanted her input on this, so I asked her to, to come along, too. And I said, I think there's a very real possibility that within um, a couple weeks, we are going to have to close down for a bit. And my, my team knows that I go out of my freaking mind if we have to close for a snow day. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, don't get me wrong. I, I, I love curling up under a blanket, uh, you know, with a hot toddy as much as the next person. But I, I hate the idea that I've got students who love their training, uh, that I've got families who pay us uh, every month and and the idea of canceling classes. And that's one day. So I said, listen, we I think there's a very real possibility that we are going to be closed for a couple weeks. How do we continue to deliver instruction uh, during that time? Here's what I propose. And what I laid out was that um, we put all of our curriculum on, on video, into a video library. We had done that to a certain uh, amount um, on our website for our members when I realized that um, people were having some difficulty, uh, for instance, practicing their katas at home, because you know uh, how it is, you, 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 you learn your latest moves um, on the dojo mat, you're feeling good about it, you go home and practice, and you're like, oh crap, how does that go again? So we had already done that to a limited amount, putting our curriculum um, on, on video for our students to access. But I said, let's do everything. 
and we'll do it modularly so that we can put together classes. So we'll take a warm up video, we'll take um, um, an instruction on basics, a, uh, a, a couple of different kicks, a couple of different hand strikes, uh, one of our blocking systems. We'll uh, take uh, we'll take a module on uh, self defense and uh, a module on kata, and we will prescribe that as um, this day's class. Great. So they've got something to watch and to, to work along with at home. But um, it was also important to me that we have um, interaction with those students as well. So how do we do that? And Zoom wasn't even on my radar at that point. Um, I wasn't familiar with that particular platform. And um, the experiences I had had with video conferencing before had just I, I had, had left me very unimpressed. So I was not even thinking about that at this point. Um, I was just thinking about how do we... Uh, I, you know, relay instruction to our students and how do they communicate back with us? So we came up with this idea that the students um, would would watch these videos, would practice along with them, do some extra practice, and then they would have assignments. Okay, uh, record yourself uh, doing these kicks, this combination, and, and this part of this kata, if you're a particular belt. Give assignments by belt. Send us the video. And within 24 hours, you're going to get a video back from one of your instructors with personalized feedback on what they saw. And this, Leanne, this genius of a, of a, a computer uh, person, um, actually made the platform that made this possible, mm. um, which still blows my mind. Um, How did the students respond? What did they think? Um, it's within the first week, um, we had hundreds of submissions. Wow. I was, I was just, I was blown away. I, I was, I was so excited. And, um, but again, this, the, the, the timing just seemed to be just right. So this was a Thursday evening, Jeremy, that we, we, we had this dinner and we decided that this was our, our course of action. And then things started happening much quicker than we thought. Uh, the next day, um, uh, classes were canceled at the local schools. Um, that evening on, on a Friday evening, um, one of my students who I was uh, preparing to test for black belt, um, who was supposed to meet me with, uh, other black belt candidates at sunrise on Saturday morning, um, on, uh, on what we call the rail trail an old railroad track where we would start our boot camps running, uh, emailed me and, and said, uh, you know, Sheehan, uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. I'm, I'm, I'm not coming to boot camp tomorrow because I really feel like um, everybody starts needing to take these measures to um, social distance and flatten the curve. And th these, these, these were new terms at the time and already they were starting to bug me. I, it just, it, it drove me crazy, the, the, these, these new buzzwords, you know, flattening the curve, social distancing. And I was actually annoyed by this email at first. Um, I think more annoyed by the suggestion that um, our routine was going to be um, disrupted, that our training was going to be disrupted by the intrusion of, of this virus. I, I, I was still, I think, a little bit in denial mode. But I woke up early, early, early on Saturday, pre-dawn, and had slept on it and said, oh, my God, she's right and canceled classes for that day. That was uh, Saturday, March 14th, 2020. And Jeremy, it was the only day that we did not have instruction for our students. And I couldn't be prouder of our team. Um, at, mm. at the time, that, that very long weekend, I referred to it as, as our own personal Manhattan project. We got everybody together, um, you know, in instructors and assistant instructors and, you know, all the people who you know, did, did anything with the dojo. And we spent the weekend putting together this video library. And Leanne put, uh, it was put together um, the, the platform on it and, and made it all possible so that, that we could uh, do this. I mean, everyone was just, you know, burning the midnight oil over this very long weekend. And on Monday, the 16th, we debuted what we called uh, the, the remote dojo. And, and like I said, our, our students just took to it right away. That's amazing. I'm, I'm amazed. That's amazing. I've, I've heard a lot of anecdote 
about what the last year has been for martial arts schools. And, and we've heard from a number of people on this show. We've heard some of the really good stuff. We've heard, you know, we've, we've of course, all heard stories about schools going under. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I came out and said very early on, I think you and I have talked about this. I know I've talked about this on the show because we released some some bonus episodes. And I was very clear, I think this was last March, for the schools that are willing to really embrace this as an opportunity and step up and deliver extra value, when things come back to normal, you will be blown away at the support you receive from your existing students in your community. And you and I, of course, have, have talked outside of the show, but um, is that what you're experiencing? Absolutely. Um, certainly a, a lot of goodwill from it because um, as it is to, to my life and, and to yours, Jeremy, the, 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 the martial arts plays such an important role in, uh, in, in those of our, our students, of our, our dojo community. And so they were looking for um, for something uh, to, to to stay steady, to stay grounded, um, to, you know, they were looking for some peace in a very scary and upsetting time. And the fact that we could still provide that for them, they were extremely grateful for it. And it's 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 funny. I've, I've heard that from our community over and over again. It, it just seems like every single family um, that um, that's that's a part of our dojo family has it at one time or another, if not multiple times, said, thank you so much for doing this. We're so grateful, so amazed. And it, it always strikes me as funny when they say that uh, f for two reasons. One is I'm the one who's grateful. I am so <laughs> I I am so grateful to them that they were willing to embrace um, these innovations and these very very strange and very far from perfect ways to train. Um, but I also think it's it's funny that they think it's it's amazing that we would do this because what was our option? Right. We were we were literally fighting for our survival 15 years we had built up this school caroline and i and then the people who have, have come along over those 15 years and become part of the family and invested themselves into to building uh this this re remarkable dojo community um and suddenly we were faced with the very real possibility that it could all come crashing down and there is no greater uh, motivator in the world than, than terror. Uh, and so we were we were just trying to, to stay alive. And I'm so grateful that um, we had the team that had um, the, the passion and the commitment and the talent to do it. But um, just as much, if not more so, uh, the community of, of students that were willing to go along on this really crazy ride. And... Um, and, and say, uh, okay, this, this might seem kind of weird, learning martial arts by watching videos and then sending a video of myself to you. And now you're going to send a video back to me. This is how we're doing this now. But they, they jumped on and they did it. And they did it again and again, because as you know, anyone um, out there who, who uh, runs a school, and who survived uh, through the pandemic, um, I'm sure, you know, experienced over this past year we were constantly reinventing ourselves hmm. yeah the remote dojo worked great but suddenly we realized you know what not having in-person actual um real-time interaction with each other um is is it just sucks and we got to change that and you know so we educated ourselves on 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 Zoom and and how how, you know, how a streaming class would work and we upgraded our internet um, uh, infrastructure uh, at the dojo which which was awful so we got the you know the, the premium streaming package so we 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 could do that and so so now we're doing Zoom classes uh, for the first time and that was a huge learning curve again for our team but also for the community and then came the opportunity to do outdoor classes and that's I, again, it's just kind of a, it was a whole new thing for everybody. So um, 
you know, during this time and, and, and all throughout this time, we're doing martial arts without contact. And for, for us, um, you know, actual um, self-defense and, and inspiring and so forth is, is a big part of what we do. Um, and to, to try to do that without making contact was, was just crazy. And it, it just required um, deconstructing everything taking everything we knew about the practice of martial arts and the instruction of, of, of martial arts and taking it all apart and saying, okay, what are the essentials here? Um, and, and how can we make those work? Um, and, and what, what do we have to come up with, um, in order to give uh, somebody as authentic a training experience, um, as possible, under these really difficult uh, circumstances. It, it was constantly, constantly doing that. Um, and that is another way, when you talk about how we're emerging from this um, stronger than ever, I think certainly there is um, the goodwill that we're talking about, um, the fact that our dojo, our martial arts instruction, our time spent together as a martial arts community helped us all get through this crisis. There's a lot of goodwill from that. Um, it's made a lot of people very interested in training. And we've got, we've got more new students in, in the past couple months than I think we've ever had in, in, in a, a, a couple month period. Um, and th there's that too. But another big gain out of uh, emerging from this is the fact that having deconstructed everything we've done and having had to look at everything in very new, sometimes very strange ways, I think will ultimately um, has made us much better teachers, has given us a much better understanding of our art um, and of how to um, educate other people in that art. Hmm. Wow. What you're reporting is in unique. I'm hearing from some schools, the schools that kind of had your approach. I hate having to cancel school, cancel classes because of weather. I hate having to shut down. We shut down for one day. You are not alone in that. There are plenty of martial arts schools out there that even if it didn't manifest in the exact same way, they had that same feeling, that same attitude, and they found ways to continue the effort because, you know, we, we could probably have a deep philosophical conversation here. What is, what is your job? It's, your job is not to open this brick and mortar location. Your job is to convey information. Your job is to teach martial arts and you got to work with whatever parameters the universe throws at you to meet that goal. And, and that's what you did. Well, and people understand that. And it, it was also time too in the, the biggest, most dramatic way possible to, to walk the walk and to practice what we've preached all this time. Hmm. Because I've, I've always said to my students to be a martial artist, and in particular, if you aspire to, to black belt excellence, what that means is that you are a person who can move forward under any circumstances, faced with any hardship, any threat, any sort of chaos, to keep your cool, to say, how do I deal with this? How do I not only survive it, but how do I thrive in this? That has, as, as, as a teacher that has, and a martial artist, that has been my mantra all along. That is, to me, the, the ultimate end of our training, is, is to be that sort of resilient and capable person. So... This was it. The, the, as you say, the biggest existential crisis that martial arts schools could, could possibly face. It was time to walk the walk. Everything that we've been saying 
um, all this time uh, about who we are and what we do um, and, and, and to survive and, and ultimately to thrive. And how are things going now? You know, you, you mentioned tons of new students, but what's, what's the tone like in the school? What's the, you know, what are students that have been through all of this? You know, how, how are they feeling? Um, euphoric because, and, and this, and this is the wonderful thing too. Now we've got to return to making contact with each other. And it started off, it started off small, um, in, in, in February, um, when the first people got vaccinated and I, and I was among the first, um, I'm, I'm also a, a first responder. Um, I'm a firefighter. So I, I got among the first, uh, jabs and, uh, we have a, a number of people in our community who are, um, in healthcare, um, and our first responders. And so all of us who had been vaccinated, we started doing classes, um, where we were making contact with each other and, just the looks on people's faces or in their eyes anyway, because we're still wearing masks. I mean, it was, it was rapturous, you know, <laughs> for, you know, for, for someone to be blocking real punches and to be, you know, doing throws and, and sweeps and to be grabbing each other for escapes. Um, it was, it, it was something that we had been missing so much. And it's, it's something that only martial artists uh, can understand what, what it means to actually trade blows with somebody who you like and respect. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, hugging uh, your, your, your mom after you haven't seen her for a couple of years. I mean, it's, it's that kind of, oh, this feels so good. Um, you know, good for your soul kind of feeling. Um, and and now more and more of the adults um, are, are are vaccinated. Um, we have uh, we a couple weeks ago um, uh, surveyed parents, and um, a large number of them gave permission to uh, for their uh, kids um, while still masked to start making contact with each other. Um, more yet gave uh, permission for their kids to make contact with vaccinated instructors. So our students, after more than a year, are starting to do uh, their karate training, um, their self-defense uh, training, the way it's meant to be done. Mm -hmm. And everybody missed it so much, those who were uh, students before uh, the pandemic. And and meanwhile, the the students who joined us during the pandemic and there were more than I ever thought there, there would be um, and who really liked what it was all about. They're suddenly seeing just this whole nother dimension and yeah. they're, and they're loving it. So, I mean, people are the, the excitement level right now. I can't imagine anything that I could have engineered um, but Jeremy to, to make people as excited um, and ecstatic about their martial arts training than, than this um, emergence um, or, or re-emergence into the world of like actual contact self-defense training. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so what are you, what are you going to do with that energy? You know, when we, let, let's, you know, we've talked about the now and the, and the, and the before, let's talk about the later. What's, what's coming? What are, what are you doing to capitalize on this and maintain that, I guess that that overall feeling of excitement that really it's coming through in your voice. And I imagine <laughs> that if it's coming through in your voice, everybody's experiencing it when they're on the mats. Uh, yes, they are. Well, I I wish I could answer that in in a more concrete way. Um, where I find myself um, now, and it's, you know, it's, if, if you're not trying to solve one conundrum, um, it, it's, you're, you're trying to solve another one. I mean, the, the existential threat is gone. We, we've survived it, but that really is the question, Jeremy, now. And, and I'm not sure I have the answer yet. Um, I, I do know that, um, we are actively, and when I uh, say uh, we, I'm, I mean Caroline and I, and um, uh, you know our top instructors, our and our top staff, our team, uh, we're starting to talk about what 
um, the, the schedule is going to look like now. It's it's been um, it has been kind of a restricted schedule as far as the number of students we could teach. Uh, the, the way that we were teaching them, uh, the classes are shorter because we had to do such a uh, rigorous uh, desanitizing of um, our training spaces in between classes. Um, and now we're slowly moving towards the larger classes again, um, longer classes uh, again, and also armed, like I said, with this this these new thoughts on on best practices as far as martial arts instruction so i i i, I just in, in an email to to everybody yesterday um i refer to it as the great reset i said look the last thing that we want to do right now is go back to the way that we were doing things before simply because that was the way we were doing things before. There is a ton of things that I love about the way we taught um, our offerings on the schedule. Because we have our core curriculum classes, but we also have um, a, a lot of uh, extracurricular classes that are open to all our, our members, uh, martial arts, weapons, sparring, uh, grappling classes, um, some kind of higher contact uh, self-defense uh, classes. There are a, a, a lot of things that I really love about what we did before, but with this great reset, let's Let's let everything be on the table. Let's say, okay, let's consider this, you know, the dojo 3.0. If, if 1.0 is pre-COVID and 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, all the iterations that we've had in, in the years since have been the, the pandemic area dojo. Now we have a chance to almost build this community from scratch with all this wonderful, wonderful material we have. Um, and, and that includes the, the instructors, the, the, the students, um, the, the curriculum. And let's just keep our minds open to the opportunities that, that this reset has offered us to make something brand new and better than ever before. I love it. I love it. If people want to find you and your school and, and the stuff that you've got going on, where would they go? Websites, email, social media, all that good stuff. Uh, we are uh, the dojo Salisbury. And Salisbury is S-A-L-I-S-B-U-R-Y. You can uh, find us at thedojosalisbury.com. Uh, uh, you can find us uh, at the Dojo Salisbury uh, uh, Facebook uh, page. And uh, you'll, you'll see uh, a, a lot of videos of our training, our, our just uh, world-class uh, demo team, um, our, our thoughts on training in, in, our, uh, in our martial arts blog. And... Uh, um, Let's see, uh, see a little bit about what we're about. Um, I know I've uh, ended up visiting uh, the, the, the sites and the social media platforms of guests that you've had before. And I always find it uh, just a, a really, really fun um, experience. It's, it's great to see um, so many different people with the same core passion that you have who yeah. just practice it and express it in, in so many different interesting ways. I, I love it. It's great. It's great. Now you've listened, you know what's coming. Final words. So I'm going to record an outro in a little while. But for the folks listening, this is their last time hearing your voice on this episode. So what would you say to them? At this point in time, consider this your own great reset this difficult time that all of us went through um, really it, it upended our routines um, it pointed out just how precious 
are so many of the things that we took for granted in, in, in 2019. See this as an opportunity to look at things with brand new eyes. Don't just go back to your pre-pandemic life. Don't just go back to doing things the way you did them because that was the way that you did them. Look at your, your life, your routines, your art, your practice, your training. Look at it like a beginner and make it what you want to be. I told you at the top, he's a great storyteller. And yeah, if you've stuck around this long, you definitely know. You, you heard it. and I've got a feeling you all stuck around. What a powerful, powerful story. And I think the part that stuck out for me the most was this notion that he was on this path and didn't even realize it. And yet all these things fell into place and led him where he is now. And I think we can all identify with that to a certain degree. But it's really clear when you get to see it in someone else's life. So, Sheehan, Kendall, thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking to me. I know we'll talk again soon. Really, really appreciate getting to know you better. If you want to get to know him better, you want to check out the school or the, any of the other things that we talked about, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Hit the show notes, episode 618. That's where you're going to find all the stuff that we do with each and every episode to give you more context, more value. And you can check out all the other episodes that we do that with as well. And if you're up for supporting us, you know, if you've got some, got some choice here. Oh, you could share an episode, leave a review, Apple Podcasts, Google, Facebook. You could tell a friend about us because believe it or not, there are plenty of martial artists that still do not listen to this show. Or you could contribute to the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Don't forget, we've got these strength training programs, speed training program, cardio fight conditioning program, lots of good stuff, whistlekickprograms.com. We're working on new ones constantly. We actually have two in development right now. Don't forget the code podcast15 to get you 15% off everything at whistlekick.com. And if you have suggestions for topics for our Thursday shows, guests for our Monday shows, I want to hear them. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's it. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.